Welcome to We Choose to Thrive. This is our interview series with women who have decided to rise above the abuse, no matter what kind of abuse it was, of their past, and to live rich, full lives. We hope you will enjoy our interview series. So Shannon, this is just a delight to have you on. Claire from Australia, correct? Yes, indeed. Wow, this is so, so much fun. So you were in our first We Choose to Thrive series, can kind of share your story, and you wrote a book about your story as well. Yeah, but the Blood on My Hands. The Blood on My Hands, that's right. This chapter, though, was written about a woman that you met so, so after writing your own chapter and being able to be out in the world making a difference for other women that have gone through really tough things. Share a little bit about that story, if you don't mind. Yes, um, in my travels, I meet lots and lots of people, and it's um, it's funny that people that have been through trauma are kind of like a beacon for other people. I, I don't know, they just sense it, so therefore people disclose um, information about themselves to you. And this lady was very elderly, and it just happened, sorry, it, it just happened that we were um, having dinner, and she she suddenly just told me a bit about her childhood. Um, I mentioned a couple of things about my childhood and then she, of course, um, started to disclose to me some horrific things that had happened to her as a child. Uh, she was 96 and um, for her, this must have been like so cathartic in a way but also so painful because she'd never told anyone else. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and so she started, of course, she was telling me and crying at the same time but without sobbing um, and it was just heart-wrenching but the words that she said to me is, I'm so ashamed. I think shame is such a yeah. big, big thing that unfortunately shame, guilt, fear, anger, mm -hmm. all of those are, are very normal feelings when we've gone through abusive type of things. Yeah, um, it, it kind of um, evoked in me the thought shame versus guilt. Right. Um, and shame is I am bad and guilt, of course, is I have done something bad. I think that's the best analogy I could, I could read up on. And um, when she said she, was, she felt she was so ashamed, it, it immediately me thought, made me think of other people and I thought, well, it's... I am bad. That's what they're thinking. I am bad. And this is all because of something that's been thrust upon them as a child or an adolescent or even as a woman. And that is absolutely, it's so sad because it's been thrust upon them. They haven't really done anything. And um, so the shame comes purely from another person. It does. And what was fascinating about the story you wrote about her and when I mention guilt is that many times we are made to feel like we are the guilty ones. That's right. Um, you know, in my own bringing up, it was, you know, it's your fault. You know, you're ugly, stupid, and whatever, and you'll never make it in the world, but it's your fault, you know. Yes, and so we, right. we throw up that burden. It's a heavy burden to carry. Yeah, it's a horrible burden. And mm -hmm. um, she, she actually said, you know, when her, when her father actually died, um, because he was the abuser, she said... Go ahead. <laughs> okay. She said, I feel so shamed and I also feel so guilty that he could never love me. And I thought, this is so sad because she's gone for 96 years with these terrible feelings all because of that person, you know, and... Um, and she was a wonderful person and constantly a high achiever trying to trying to better herself. Um, she was, however, on a flip side, um, she was a hoarder. And I think it was because so many things in her life had been destroyed. She came from a very poor background. Um, her mother was a woodcutter, <laughs> which um, <clears throat> when you looked at the stature of her, she was oh, would have just been over four foot, like tiny, tiny person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you think of her mother cutting down trees, you think, oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, um, and, of course, Victorian era, um, very, very rigid in the way they thought. 
um, rigid in their standards. You did not speak about anything, you know, that was inside the family. And I think that basically um, she had been brought up to think, well, it's all my fault. I've just got to keep quiet and um, forge ahead, which she did. But she, she had this wonderful property which had been her mother's, like it was a family property. And over the years, because 96 years is a lot of years, she kept, everything, she kept everything in fear of losing herself, I think. Um, so she, she filled her house up and she bought a caravan. She filled a caravan up. She bought another caravan. She filled that up, bought another. And like by the time that she allowed me on the property, she never would have visitors. She met everyone externally. She'd go into town. She'd meet people at a band practice. She'd meet people um, down the street for coffee. She'd meet people at meetings or, you know, um, or on wherever she could, as long as they didn't come onto her property. I mean, she was... So I was so upset about it. But, and she said, I'm so ashamed. I don't want you to see this. And I thought about it and I thought, really, all she's done is try to preserve her life. She's tried to keep it there. Um, yes, it, it was the foibles and it was the, the misery and all those things that she couldn't let go of. But um, it was her. Think of the, you know, that was her protected that just kept her safe because she didn't have what she even the love she needed let alone right. let alone maybe even the financial stability as a child so um that went on for all of her life yeah and you and you would never have known she dressed immaculately um everything about she still went out every day um and she, of course, adopted animals and did all those wonderful things that you do when you you have a when you want and crave unconditional love, you know. Um, but she was a, a very wonderful person, and um, and I think that that shame lived on in her personal life, and she tried so hard to shield that from others. No, no one would have known, and that's. Um, I think like so many, so many women, they, they hide it away. Um, even when they disclose, they can go into a room and just feel overwhelmed by, by the guilt, the shame, the injustice of it all. And that's my next chapter, injustice, because you always, yeah, because people always say what goes around comes around, don't they? And sometimes it doesn't. And that's, that's the tragedy of it all. Right, it is. Well, there's, there's story is so well written and really addresses something that I feel um, very seldom gets addressed. And when we see older people, I have an aunt that's in her 90s as well. And okay. she had a terrible, terrible upbringing as a child. But, and she will order and takes in every pet in the universe. It's, you know, yeah. between birds and dogs and cats and it's just like crazy. It's, you know. Yeah. And, but that's where she's happiest and that's where she's, you know, that she even took in a lot of children, you know, to, as foster children and, and to some extent to the harm of her own children because she, her heart was just so big, but she didn't know how to have the balance that, that was necessary. So the beauty of this to me is that you you have the heart to see the big story because we know that so many have gone to the grave never having uttered a word mm. and we live in a society today that is waking up to all of these kind of things and we're saying no more and that's what we choose to thrive is is about is that we the more of us that can stand up and tell our stories and tell the stories of others when we have the ability like you did to to make it come to this place where the more of us that speak up it's almost like some of them you know there's me too the me too campaign and then there's the i'm a statistic campaign these are people that have realized that it's time to stop the nonsense and change it for the generations that come come after us I think I think that's a, a very good point. But on the flip side, I think it is so important that people realise it's a very good point, but people need to stop saying things like get over it, um, you should be over this by now. 
30 years down the track or, or whatever because it's something that lives with people every day. It's it not, not something you can get over. It, it's there. It's part, it's embedded into your psyche. Um, for many people, the abuse, the abuse has been continual. So therefore, it's been in their formative years. And um, to get over it, it, I suppose the only, you don't get over it, but you need to find the balance, like you said before. And that, that is a self, a self thing. You have to, you have to find that balance that's for yourself. Other people can't do it for you. And that's, I think, the hard journey. It is our journey. Yeah, I. Um, it feels like when we when we are told to get over it, that that builds a wall that goes even higher. But at the same time, when we decide to to like for her even to share her story, that was huge for her. That was a big piece of, and hopefully it brought her some healing and some peace, you know, mm. to her life. But it isn't about. It's almost like we have like living in a rear view mirror, you know, we're looking back all the time, but it's until we have come to a place where we're, where it feels safe enough to start healing from it and doing something about it. Yeah. And I think I, that, sorry. I, I would say many people that I've spoken to, they say the last thing they think of before they go to sleep and the first thing they think of when they wake up is, is the abuse only because that's there and that's their quiet time and I think it's in quiet times when it's loudest um, oh it is yeah um, that's why we all try to stay so busy that's <laughs> right workaholics <laughs> it's, part of, it's part of the uh, I think the <laughs> the description isn't it the job description is oh you've been abused I work more and you don't think about it yeah I can relate to that very cool well, thank you so much. And tell me, just for our listeners, will you share a little bit what sharing your own story? Because I know you wrote your own story and then you've, you've written it. You were in our chapter in our first of the series, We Choose to Thrive. What did that do for you? I think in some ways it made me look. Oh, I mean, it's the whole thing of like you shy away from it. You say, I'm not going to think about that now. It, it made me put things down on paper, which meant that I could, I had to read it. Um, you know, I, I found that it, it um, I found it very painful. The whole process was hideous for me. Um, I still, yeah, I still, every time someone says, oh, they've read the book, I, I, it's that shut down. It's that, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And I, I panic and you feel, you feel like your heart's going to, I don't know, just contracting and it's a horrible feeling. But by, by doing it, I felt I did it for myself. Um, I didn't do it for notoriety because um, it's one of those things that when you put something down on paper, you, you feel you're going to be judged and um, that's probably what makes it so difficult. I feel that it, it, um, it gave me some clarity. I think that's important. <coughs> Excuse me. It made me think about consequences, uh, consequences for myself rather than for the abuser because that wasn't on the cards anyway. The abuser, the abuser kind of got away anyway. So, um, but consequences for me and, and how I react in certain situations and why I'm like I am. Um, I think that was probably the biggest, biggest um wake up thing for me I could go oh my gosh that's why I don't like Devon's sandwiches oh that's why I hate yeah. you know oh, th these little things that these nuances which you've had all your life and you think oh that's just reacting in such a silly way but really it's reacting to a really important not a milestone but event that has happened in your life and um, I think triggers yeah, and yeah. everyone has it. Everyone has it. It could be a blue flower. Um, it could be a hat for someone. It could be anything. It could be and a I, smell. It could be yeah. a, a picture. It could be anything. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And the other thing was the nightmares haven't stopped, but by putting it on paper, it, because I was addressing things, um, I think that it did alleviate because I, I would, I was chronic every night and, and, and I still don't sleep, but I think I sleep a bit better. 
Yeah. yeah. And you've done a lot to work on on the healing process and and it, what it and that's just it. It is a process. You know. And it's the honesty. If you can as soon as you do something like that, you say, Oh, such a relief because you've spoken out it's your honesty and it's something that you kept hidden so it's and that's that doesn't feel good that whole i'm going to put the wall up and hide from people doesn't feel good no it doesn't work either yeah. no it doesn't work so well i wanted to thank you so much for shannon for just being a part of this and having the love in your heart to do something like this on behalf of all of us with we choose to thrive thank you You're thank you awesome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for watching this We Choose to Thrive interview. If you are currently in an abusive situation, please seek help immediately. Our purpose in creating this book and video series is to form a sisterhood of support. Know that abuse is abuse no matter what kind it is. The stories in this We Choose to Thrive series are as many and varied as the people in it. If this resonates with you, we welcome you and invite you to join us. If you know someone who would benefit from hearing this interview, please feel free to share.